So yeah, I want to talk a little bit about uh, visual beam development uh, with Apache Hop. Actually, I just talked to uh, a few people actually about my visit to the Beam Summit in Berlin three years ago where I presented something similar in its early stages on Kettle. So it's been quite a journey uh, to get here. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Apache Hop. And since I've seen so few people uh, doing actually live demos, I thought I'd give it a shot this year, right? A live demo, uh, show a little bit about the Apache Hop core concepts and the tools, and uh, then dive into running something on Google Cloud Platform Dataflow, and also on uh, the Elastic uh, Kubernetes service on, on AWS. And then uh, a little bit about uh, future developments, stuff that we've been doing. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about why we're doing data integration tools. So maybe people will say, uh, oh, uh, the only thing I want to do is script stuff or program stuff. And that's, that's fine, right? But uh, for a lot of the like ETL tools, data integration tools out there. The goal is really to bridge the gap between the needs of the organization and the needs of, and the possibilities out there of techs and, and develop, developers. So a couple of concerns that organizations have is the setup cost of uh, implementing new technology, maintenance costs, the running costs, time to market, resource availability of not just technology, but people as well. Things like the bus factor, right? <laughs> If, if, uh, if you're the only person in an organization that knows Apache Beam, then that's a, a bus factor. Right? The DevOps side of things, how can we manage something when it's when solution is running? How do we keep track of, of all the moving parts? Um, the concerns of developers are ability to succeed, I think, mostly having fun, ability to learn things, get sleep, have a vacation, you know. <laughs> Uh, work, family, time, that sort of stuff, and um, so. But these are these are the sort of the concerns that guide uh, Apache Hop. We we try to facilitate all aspects of data metadata orchestration on both sides of of this gap. Okay. And uh, so, typical use cases for Apache Hop are data integration, data orchestration, ETL extraction, transformation, loading. Um, but yeah. That world is really big, data migration, message processing, synchronization, you know, uh, internet of things, big data, the buzzwords that you see flying around. And uh, um, so what's the name, right? Hop stands for the Hop Orchestration Platform. So yeah, try to keep it as simple as possible. And um, so for orchestration, we mean like uh, pipelines and workflows. So we. It's a little bit of like a business process management workflows because there's always things that you need, files that you need to copy, folders that you need to clean up. It's always like the, the stuff that nobody wants to talk about. And before you know it, you're scripting bash shell scripts or Python or whatever. And again, that incurs a maintenance cost and somebody needs to know about the scripts and needs to find it and needs to schedule it. And so, um, you know, there's also a lot of metadata that, floats around a project like this, uh, connection information to databases, uh, preferred folder names, server names, host names, you know, that sort of stuff. So we, we, we specialize in handling that as well. And then obviously, like, insights. This has come back at this conference a few times. Alex from Boxall did a talk about open telemetry and the importance of, of, of getting metrics about how many rows, where is something running, how long did it take, did it, did it error out or not, where is my logging going, very important stuff, right? And then, uh, yeah, configurations. This is becoming like more and more important for us in the sense that we, we no longer run something on a server, right? It always runs on some Docker container somewhere, on Docker Compose, Kubernetes. It's no longer... Uh, that you have uh, your source code or your, your, your pipeline, but it runs in various locations on various platforms. And, and so we, we try to provide a platform, a GUI, user interface, a command line tools, a server, scripts, Docker instances, an SDK, Java API, documentation, the community, <laughs> the most important thing at the back, 
a chat server. There's like a YouTube channel. There's like a whole thing that goes on around uh, Apache Hub. And um, as its history, we started, or well, I started with it 21 years ago. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, like three years ago at the Apache Beam Summit in Berlin, I talked to a bunch of uh, people from the ASF and said, well, we want to do an Apache Kettle version of this, right? Which turns out that, well, we couldn't do that. We uh, all said, well, okay, then we'll rewrite Kettle. <laughs> so we started to rewrite uh, Kettle in a very substantial way in the sense that it's no longer compatible. Apache Hop is no longer compatible with Kettle although we do provide a metadata importer for it, but uh, we had so much going on in the sense of web interfaces, the, the Apache Beam plugins, uh, plugins for project management, and so on and so on. So it became too much to just all be getting all getting rejected by by uh, the owners of, of Kettle back then. And so this is, what's, uh, this is what's been going on in the meantime. Uh, yeah, we've, we've become a top-level project last year. We've done a bunch of releases. We have a homepage with version control documentation. Uh, we have integration tests running on Jenkins. So, so it's like a, it's, it's been a lot of work, right? Uh, you can download release 2.0, which is uh, our Java 11 release uh, from the downloads. Uh, yeah. So again, uh, lower development time and costs. You know, maintenance cost, transparency. Those are those are the reasons why, right? And um, this is something I wanted to talk about a little bit. Again, this this comes up in a conference like this sometimes when when you hear uh, corporations talk about, oh, we are generating code, uh, beam code, instead of uh, you know typing in thousands of different pipeline codes for it, we generate uh, the code from Metadata, right? So this is how a lot of the ETL tools out there started. Uh, we start with pure code. We just code something to get some data from point A to point B. And then people started generating a code from templates. And then uh, we have tools that completely generate the code from metadata. And there's like a category of ETL tools out there, including Talent, Oracle Data Integrator, um, SAS data warehouse builder, there's like a whole bunch of them. And then uh, the next logical thing that, you, well, <laughs> logical or not, depending on your taste, and there are engines that execute metadata uh, without generating any code. And Kettle, Informatica, uh, and Apache Hop are part of this group of, of tools. Uh, so the metadata either can be entered by a human in a graphical user interface or using metadata templates, or using code or other, co other data, right? So with, uh, with an SDK. And the, the goal, again, keeping uh, an eye on the requirements is to get rid of code generation, code compilation, and code deployment phases, which are three points where uh, the ETL uh, can trip up from a DevOps point of view. Uh, so the metadata-driven architecture allows us to have no code generation and execute requirements from the metadata exactly as is without translation. And the way that I explain this is if something goes wrong and something always goes wrong, you know exactly where it was because there's no translation process in between. It's not some jar file in Java or uh, something that happens on a different server remote from where you're working. It's like... It's like the same thing, right? So easier to manage, debug, and use. And we have a pluggable execution engine uh, to translate metadata into work. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so describe the, the tasks, don't program them. We have the, the GUI, um, and uh, that helps uh, beginners to, to, to do this. And the execution of the metadata, so you can execute pipelines and workflows that we have in the user interface, but using scripts on a help server in your Java code as a web service, and like, yeah, in Beam for in Spark, Flink, and Dataflow, uh, but also your scheduler with Jenkins, Airflow, and a Docker container. Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, we, we want to be cheap, easy, fast, transparent, predictable, innovative. And uh, obviously we're uh, Apache licensed and we can scale back the architecture from the 500 plus megabytes as it is to smaller than 30, me 30 megabytes. Um, so everything is a pluggable, a plugin in our architecture, even data types and database drivers, the Beam uh, plugin is pretty big. So if you have things like edge devices, small Raspberry Pi sitting out in the field requiring little energy, and all we need to do is, is stream temperature every couple of minutes to an IoT device, to an IoT queue somewhere, MQTT. If that's all you need, you can scale up way back and it's very small and, and light and nimble. So, so that's why we, we opted for this. Or lambdas, right? So serverless, that was a big thing a few, <laughs> some time ago. And now everybody seems to want to get rid of it. But yeah, for those smaller uh, services, that makes sense. OK. Um, we're very proud of our version control documentation. This was an idea that we got from Neo4j. It's all ADOC, and it's really nice to be able to document code changes in the same uh, Git repository. And so that gets, uh, the HTML then gets documented. Uh, it gets generated by Jenkins by the same build server that builds our code and published to the website. And uh, our integration tests, if I have time left, I'll show you some of those. But yeah, they're, they're a really critical component for us to provide stability from one release to another. Uh, when a lot of things are changing, you want to provide that backward compatibility layer. And this comes in the form of hundreds and hundreds of uh, workflows and, and pipelines which run every night. Uh, so whenever we release something, we, we, we're certain that it's fairly stable. And when we have new features coming in from our uh, community, then, yeah, we want to have a, uh, an extra integration test in the form of a workflow and pipeline to go with that. And, uh, the user interface is also something that's been completely rewritten from scratch a few years ago, and we wanted to provide uh, better, a better experience for high uh, dots per inch displays and the visually impaired. So if you want to have really big characters on your screen, that's possible. The rest of the GUI will follow, and uh, all icons and, and everything will scale up, and that's really important. Um, in the age of 4K displays and 8K displays, and you know, it's just horrible to have these really tiny icons, right? And uh, yeah, we support four platforms Windows, OS X, Linux, and Web. And we have a dark mode now supported on all platforms. Windows was a bit of a problem for a while, but that's now fixed. And uh, you can actually run this. Um, a hop uh, GUI in a browser, and I will do so in a second, obviously, <laughs> All right? So let's go over the core concepts of, of, uh, of hop. Let's just... Uh... So if you download and unzip it, you get a hop folder, very simple, and there's a bunch of shell scripts for OS X and Linux. Hopconf allows you to configure all aspects of, uh, of Hop. You can create new projects or, or lifecycle environments or uh, configure uh, system variables, uh, configure uh, security settings for the various plugins. So Hop has like virtual file system support for Google Storage, Amazon S3, and Azure's Blob Storage. Uh, there's also uh, Dropbox and Google Drive, and a couple of others, I guess. <laughs> so, but the, the lot of security things. And the way that this is done is, is, is the plugin system has GUI features, but also configuration features. So, this HopConf script uh, picks up the pluginizable, the plugins, and the options. So, that, that means that everything that you can do in the GUI, you can also do from the command line. This is important for if you want to script your own Docker container or your own solution, right? Uh, the Hub GUI is the GUI. Hub import imports metadata from other tools. Hub run runs a pipeline or workflow. So it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Hub search allows you to search for keywords or, or 
uh, anything in a project or an environment so that if you forgot if you forgot to uh, replace a or replace a hard coded IP address with a variable somewhere and and you run it in production and you get like an error and you're like oh my god on this server I forgot to uh, then you can just search for that IP address and it will say in this file this is where it's referenced right so that makes it easier as for those people that are like uh, stuck behind uh, three linked SSH tunnels to a remote server somewhere you don't have a GUI always. The hub server um, runs a server <laughs> that you can use to do remote execution of uh, pipelines and workflows. So you could have like a hub uh, server on a uh, Spark master somewhere and then fire off basically the Spark submit of your uh, Beam pipeline in this case on that server. And that's because, yeah, Flink and, and Spark are not as great as Dataflow in doing remote execution. The Hub Translator is used by our community to translate the user interface and everything. So we have translations in uh, Japanese, Portuguese, Italian, French, uh, and a couple of other languages. Not all of them are uh, complete or 100%, but yeah, these things keep advancing. So let's take a look at the hub GUI. Uh, GUI and um, so one of the things to note here is this visible? Yeah, I guess right. I guess it is right. So the pr the project, if you download a new version of Hub in a clean installation, you will see a samples project and a default project there. In the samples project, you can find all sorts of cool uh, beam examples, all right? So maybe what I can do is just uh, take that uh, command, right? There you go, <laughs> and just just run this. But this is the the same GUI that we didn't get in a browser, so that's the idea. Uh, so that takes a couple of seconds to start up. And um, so this is what you got. I have a, a whole bunch of other projects, but in this case, you just go to the samples project, uh, and then you can open a file in the Beam um, folder, pipelines. Uh, this is, for example, something really simple. Uh, um, is this visible, I guess? So this reads. Um, so this reads from uh, a file, a beam file input uh, transform, which says I'm going to read from a dollar data input. <laughs> this is designed to run on a local machine, but also on on Spark Flame data flow, right? So, and it has a file definition, which is just uh, the layout of the file structure, and um, so this is a, a typical pipeline. There are other things that you can do, like a workflow. A pipeline is like a parallel set of transforms that are running. You already know the beam concepts. It's exactly the same as it is in, in, in Hop. And a workflow is basically, it has a starting point, and it's then a sequential sequence of actions that are taken. And based on the result of an action, you can say, well, okay, the deletion of the files work, let's say I want to do another task, which is a pipeline. You can have um, a green arrow, which is success, so now I can do the next thing, or failure, I can do another thing, and failure is then, okay, I can send out an email, or I can send out an SNMP trap, or, you know, it's the sort of thing that can help you manage the ecosystem around your work, around your pipelines clean out a folder, FTP some stuff from a server, or do a remote uh, secure FTP, or whatever. Right? There's so many things that you need to do. Um, but yeah, so that's a workflow and a pipeline. Um, so we also have like a whole bunch of metadata around, in the beginning we just had a few things, but if you look at this, um, obviously like MongoDB connections, hop servers that we want to address, 
Neo4j connections, partition schemas. That's uh, uh, pipeline logging is basically a pipeline that gets executed every time that you, you execute another uh, pipeline. So it's a sort of like reflection, right? So and that pipeline that gets all the information about the running or started pipeline. So the name, ID, uh, the logging text, and then you can send that out anywhere you want to your own database to S3. You don't have to accept the logging system that is in, in, in Hop. You can just use do your own. Pipeline run configurations. Uh, so you can see a few of them here. Uh, the first one is obviously data flow. And these are basically a reflection of the beam pipeline uh, runners options, uh, the pipeline option uh, for data flow in this specific case. Even the tooltips that you'll see come from the Java doc <laughs> in, the, in the runners. Uh, and, um, yeah, figuring out which machine type, it would be great. Just as an example that we could get like a list of machine types from Google somewhere from a service, right? But yeah, for now, people have to type it in themselves. Uh, we put links in the documentation, so where they get that. But it makes a lot of sense to have like these options simply available, and you just set it up once for your environment, and then you can just forget about it. Uh, the fat chart listed here, and I will link you to the documentation where you can find like a getting started guide for Apache Beam here. Uh, We've come a long way in documenting all this. But the fat jar is a uh, collection of all the software in Hop, so Beam and Hop uh, combined, so that it makes it easier for us to run uh, pipelines on Dataflow, Flink, and Spark. You can generate this jar simply from, <laughs> from the GUI or from the command line. So it will take its own software and package it up for you so that you don't have to worry about this. You can also use the hop conf, uh, hop conf script to generate it. Um, the direct runner will, will have different options, right? A, few, a couple, of, uh, a little bit less. Uh, Flink has also a bunch of them, a whole lot of them. Uh, Spark is again different. And the local execution runner is not a Beam engine, but it's a simple, optimistic, uh, single server uh, engine. It just says, I'm going I'm to take as many threads as I can. Every transform is running a separate thread and it streams the data across. You can use this to do uh, unit testing, for example. Right now, we don't support unit testing yet on Beam, which is uh, something we, we, we're working on. Um, but yeah, it's a very fast engine. Uh, because it doesn't serialize data between the different transforms. It just streams them across memory. Okay. Uh, unit testing, like I saw, uh, uh, let me just show you a unit test. So this, for example, is a unit test. Uh, let me just zoom in a little bit, otherwise you guys can't see it. Um, so what this says, basically, instead of reading from uh, the transform customer data, uh, we are um, going to get data from a data set customer's input. And so we're not going to read from whatever file or files that we define, but we're going to inject the data set that we have here. And so the, the data sets that we have here, in this case, customer's input, is just a couple of hundred rows of random uh, generated records. But we can test with that, right? So we will inject this into our transform, staying with state data. We'll squeeze it through the whole transform. And on the output side, uh, we expect that the, uh, that the golden data, sorry about this, not used to working at lower resolutions. So we, we expect that this corresponds to golden data. In this case, uh, you know, a different set of data enriched with a couple of fields and, and uh, some numbers, right? Especially the, uh, the switch cases and stuff like that, they need to be tested. So this tested a lot of functionality, and you can run this on the direct runner or on Dataflow. It's actually quite nice to see what, what these tools make of that. Um, so this means that the, the transforms that we have here, for example, uh, data that gets loaded into memory, in this case, the aggregate information, uh, lookup look counts per state here, reads data from 
uh, this group by and I load it. So this is a side load into B. This gets translated like this. Uh, so all of this gets translated. Uh, so this is the metadata perspective. We also um, supported uh, support like a file browser, like you would have in in your IntelliJ or Eclipse, like a, a folder view. And uh, through the um, how should I say this? Through the virtual file system that we support, Apache Virtual File System, Apache VFS. So we have drivers, for example, for Google Storage. And if that's configured, we can just go straight to an input file that we have. For example, the state data here that I just showed you. And there were a lot of data in, in the GUI itself, right? So this is not, if you try to load really large files, it will say, hey, hang on, <laughs> you might run out of memory, right? But um, a lot of these small reference files or JSON files are usually not that big, and you can just, just look at them. What's also cool is that, um, you can actually store the pipelines themselves in the cloud. Uh, so later on, I will be generating synthetic data on EKS, so the Elastic Cloud, uh, Elastic Kubernetes service from Amazon. Because uh, yeah, because why not? And I'll be right, right, uh, reading the data back on uh, Dataflow uh, with with this one consume from Kinesis, and then write back out this to Google Storage. Um, but this file, for example, is stored on S3. So in fact, you can create your, this is a, the samples project, and this is as like a home folder. In this case, it's straight in the source code, but uh, you can create a home folder on any location that Hub supports, including HTTP and read-only, uh, S3, Azure, uh, Azure colon slash slash, this is a blob storage or GS for Google storage or Google Drive colon slash slash for Google Drive. Right? Uh, so this makes it, I guess, easier to store uh, your pipelines and workflows in the cloud and easier to do things like uh, run Docker containers. We still need to work on, on authenticating that Docker container so that it can access that talk to Israel about this, but yeah, we're getting close to really cool solutions that we can just drop in the cloud run, fire and forget, right? Uh, so that's the file browser. It has like um, support for Git. So if you have this thing uh, running on a Git repository, you will be able to uh, do a visual diff between different pipelines, see what has changed. You can also see the textual divs and revisions. And this is obviously for when you're running on a hub web. You, you can't just go drop into the command line and do, a, and do a commit and push, right? You need to have some tool to do that. And so the file browser helps you there. Search is pretty cool. So whenever you have something like a host name reference in your project, um, it will find it and then we'll say, okay, there's a variable hub system host name. And then you can jump straight to that file and edit it. So that's useful. Uh, like I said, Hop is, is driven by plugins. These are all the different plugin types that we have. So everything from Google, uh, from the GUI, file type support. Uh, so if somebody wants to say, yeah, you, you support JSON, XML, but I have another file type that I want to support, you can just create that, drop that into the project, and it will all of a sudden be able to open a new file type in the, in the Explorer. Right? So, and then finally, my... Uh, uh, I created a uh, plugin for Neo4j, and if you point, point this to a Neo4j connection, so by setting a variable, all the transform uh, all the transforms in the pipelines, all the actions in the workflow, everything that gets executed gets logged to Neo4j, and you don't just get a, a textual log, but you get the complete like execution lineage. And it will be able to support like shortest path queries across those graphs that get created so that you can find not just what's, where something went wrong and when, but also what executed and how it got there, right? This is obviously something that, uh, that Neo4j is great at doing. And obviously we, we want to make this more generic and, and supportive of different uh, platforms, but yeah. 
uh, and I have more data in there. So that's that's what we're working on right now. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, half an hour in. That's great. Uh, <laughs> uh, so if you have um, a pipeline like this, you can run it from the GUI, uh, but you can also do this from um, Hop Run. And uh, in this case, um, I have like a, an environment called hop samples. I can just say minus environment hop samples. Oops, hop run hop samples. And then I don't even need to specify like the full path name. I can just do a relative path name. In this case, it's like, uh, I guess, beam complex uh, pipelines. Complex HPL, which run configuration, the direct runner in this case, because we can run with different engines. And yeah, that, that should do it for, for running this. Uh, well, in any case, uh, so you, you can just play around with these examples and the beam getting started guide. Let me just point you to that and, and to the hop website, obviously. <laughs> So, uh, so hopapache.org is where the goodies are at. Let me just make this a little bit smaller. And uh, you can do, go to the Getting Started uh, page. And it explains a little bit about the concepts of hop, uh, where to get it. Um, another cool option that we have is uh, uh, Academy. This is something that we've been um, that we've just been uh, experimenting with. It's a um, introduction to Hop. Uh, you can create a new account for that. It's, it's free, and it will guide you through like an e-learning module about where to download, how to use, what, how to use a GUI, what to do. So, yeah, if you have time, take a look at it and give us feedback of how you like that or not. You know. It's easier for self-learning than going through the uh, through the whole text, I guess. <laughs> uh, download is, is where you download version 2. Uh, we do a release every two, three months, pretty much like, I guess, a little bit slower than Beam. Um, but we try to keep up. And, yeah, Java 11 is what's needed. Other than, other than that, nothing. You just unzip it and start using it. Um, for Beam, you go to the documentation and uh, pipelines, get things started with Apache Beam. This is where you find uh, more details about what's going on and um, also information about the various runners, the various uh, things that you need to, to know about. It will point you to the documentation on how to set up data flow itself or the things you need to know about Flink or, or yeah, we try to be like supportive of the other Apache projects as well in that regard. So yeah, that, that should, should get you started and along with the documentation and the samples. Yeah, that, that, should, uh, that should be fine. So now let's take a look at uh, uh, one of these. Uh, let's see if I haven't forgotten anything. So you're ready to download it, pipelines, workflows, and actions. And uh, so, yeah, so what I want to talk a little bit now is uh, how do you go from um, from a pipeline and uh, making sure it works? Bef you know, the, the idea that we have is like, okay, before you run with a trillion rows out in the cloud, before it costs you like half a million dollars, right? Why not test with a few thousand rows, see if, if, if you can prove that that works. Um, so this is what these unit tests were all about. And when, we did, when I did the investigation about what other tools are out there for unit testing with data, what I found was like really complicated solutions, right? With all sorts of containerization and, and it's like a whole lot of extra 
moving parts that you need to know about just to get and so some our impression now is that this is a return on investment question we need to make it as simple as possible to create the unit tests uh, otherwise people won't be using it and uh, if you look at something as simple as uh, hang on uh, beam pipelines so we have uh, some input data from from the customer side like uh, we want to just provide a data set and what you need to do is just yeah in this case clear the input data set but just create a data set right um, set the input data set in this case customers input I provide a field mapping from the field name in the input data set to what the transform normally outputs and that's it that's all you need to do and uh, you can also supply a sort order for the data set because yeah maybe uh, the transform depends on it the transforms afterwards and so that's that's how you configure it. and you can create one or more of these unit tests uh, you can see okay so this is a unit test you can you can say this is a type of test for development or for unit testing and we have a, a um, thank you we have a um, uh, a transform but also a workflow that says okay you can run all your unit tests in the project right sort of like uh, what you would do on Jenkins so just run all of them and get the output and see if all of them work so that you don't have to run them individually manually what you can also do in the unit test is say I need to tweak all of it I need to bypass this transform I don't want to run it in my unit test but maybe you'd you also write to a file. You don't want to do this in the unit test. You can do that. Um, so, yeah, remove that. Uh, so, so once you have that, you can run this with a local engine, for example, local engine. And so it will inform you that the unit test was succeeded. And also in the logging, you will say unit test was uh, successfully executed for those Maybe that's better readable. And so, um, obviously, this quickly becomes a, a basis for our integration testing. Um, maybe I can just... Jenkins. Think something like this. And make it a little bit smaller. So, Thanks to the gracious donation of Google, we now have a budget to run daily tests on Google Cloud Platform Dataflow. So this thing that you just saw, input output, is part of our integration testing on GCP, for example. Uh, no, I'm fine with that. So this test, input output, what it does, it clears output files on uh, Google Storage. It just removes files in a folder. It executes this transform, uh, this pipeline. It reads and writes to the from a folder to a, just selects a couple of states from that data set, and afterwards it uh, it reads the data back out in a validation transform. So this uh, action basically says, "Oh, I want to run a bunch of unit tests." In this case, it's just one, but what it will do is uh, read the data back out using the Google uh, VFS driver and count them and then verify against the golden data that you get the same thing, right? You check sums and it does certain things. And that simple uh, workflow tests a lot of stuff. It tests uh, that all the libraries are in place, that you that you can run uh, on, on, on Beam, on Dataflow. It tests uh, a lot of stuff, right? And same for our, our BigQuery tests. And we have a bunch of others lined up for BigTable, and we just wanted to see if we could run it every night, budget-wise. <laughs> but that seems to be fine. Um, so yeah, so we, we have a whole bunch of these integration test uh, projects, and uh, they all run on Docker Compose on um, Jenkins, in the sense that if we want to test functionality on Neo4j, we have a hop Docker container and a Neo4j Docker container, and we test everything. Or if we want to test on Postgres, we have hop and a Postgres, you know, that sort of thing. Um, 
So the transforms, there's like a whole bunch of them. It's like a whole bunch of, and, and they get tested every night. And so the, the, the principle of this is, okay, we, we made it very easy for you to add integration tests at unit tests. So there's no more any excuse to not do it. Right? Does that make sense? And this helps the project tremendously if people contribute new things. And in a certain way, they also serve as examples for the functionality of, of, uh, of the tool. Although we haven't opted to release them all as examples because yeah, it's, it's just not productive, I guess. So now in the last uh, 10 minutes, uh, the, the next part of the scary part of the demo, right? Uh, I wanted to um, um, first run the, generate some data on not AQS, but EQS. The Elastic uh, Kubernetes service. So uh, I think I shut everything down before starting. So I uh, saw so, uh, some month ago or something, I saw something for about that uh, Flink has this Kubernetes operator. And what it does is instead of having to worry about where your master and your uh, and your uh, slaves, basically your, 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 uh, all your servers, are, how, they, how they're set up, we have a Kubernetes operator for Flink, which basically says, I'm going to do all that for you, right? And uh, I actually documented everything. It's in here, getting started with Beam, running a hot pipeline using the uh, Kubernetes operator. And it goes through the whole rationale. But basically what, what it does is, uh, it's, it's not a deployment, and not a Kubernetes, but a Fling deployment. And it says, okay, show me, tell me which image that I need to use. This is horrible, sorry. <laughs> How many um, um, task slots the, the, the Fling configuration has? And um, the job manager, how many, how much memory, how many CPUs, how many you want to give to the task manager for every task manager. Uh, so in, in our case, the job itself can also be executed. So it would instantiate the Flink cluster and then run using our fat jar, uh, the pipeline that you want. So in our case, we have a main class, which is a main beam class, which is usable for Spark Flink, Dataflow, and, and, uh, um, and so, so it's easy to just say, okay, well, we didn't have to do anything new in software-wise. We just use this operator. And so the way that that works is basically that um, I'm going to create uh, this Apache Hop deployment, which is going to run the, I think, Hop samples, the pipeline I just mentioned. So this is going to generate synthetic data and use that to send to Kinesis. And this is simply a GUI or a wrapper around Kinesis YO, obviously. But what it does is it uses a generate rows transform, and this is a wrapper, incidentally, around uh, synthetic, uh, and it generates an unbounded uh, set of data. Uh, it tries to do 100 rows per second, but I think this is running in Western Europe my, my uh, uh, EQS, cl EQS cluster, and it's going to send it to Dataflow. So we're going to start this pipeline on Dataflow. So, and this is on East Coast. So yeah, talk about complicating things. Uh, so what the, the logging basically says is like using this metadata, what I did is I created a pipeline uh, from the Dataflow pipeline options. And then I added the transform and then another transform, another transform, and I figured out how to connect everything. And it's going to run this now on the on the data flow uh, system. And then we need to go to data flow here, refresh the jobs. These are incidentally all the integration tests that are running every night. So this is now starting up. And on the EQ, EQS, EQS side, uh, we can actually, maybe I still have it open here. Um, 
we can actually do a port forward. This is pretty cool. Um, so the port forward needs the pot name. There we go. And so, so what it will do is it will port forward the 8081 address uh, from that remote uh, uh, pod to my local machine, so localhost 8081. And this just gives us an insight into the running job on the cluster, right? And again, it's sorry for the resolution. And so, so this thing is, is generating records. You, again, this is one of the issues that we have with the system. You don't really see a lot. My time is up. Oh, yeah, let me just wrap up a, a little bit. Um, uh, so, so this is basically how you can quickly make use of, of whatever you need to do, right? And uh, we need more execution information. So what you can see from uh, this fling thing, you don't really see anything happening. It's, it's like useless. Uh, data flow is a little bit better. It gives you some indication of rows per second and some counters, but still. Uh, so this is something we're working on. There's a whole bunch of uh, 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 innovations that we're working on. My, call, my uh, community is working on uh, beam pipeline validation and advice that we give to users and some pipeline improvements. All right. So my time is up, but I want to thank you. And if you have questions, maybe you can do it later. Oh, we have time for questions? Sure. All right, cool. Yeah. In that case, far away, I would say. <laughs>